Yes, Honorable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I associate myself with the maker of the statement. Mr. Speaker, I want to say that the, the matter in issue is one of a lifestyle matter. Is a speaker, as a result of the fact that we do not do periodic medical checkup of our health situations, sometimes we are caught up by the condition. Mr. Speaker, what is interesting is that a study was conducted by a team of public health specialists, um, and their names are Richard Ofori Asenso, Akosuya Adom Ajemain and Richard Ansa for the, the Public Health Department of Kolebu. Mr. Speaker, their studies revealed that the sedentary lifestyle of particularly urbanized people contributes greatly towards the condition that we called obesity or overweight which is a key indicator of <coughs> hypertension. Mr. Speaker, what is also alarming by their studies is that they have discovered that even children in the urban areas, no, most of them no longer even walk to schools. They are chauffeured. As a result of that time, children are also becoming obese and overweight. And they gave us some interesting statistics. For instance, they say that out of 49,000 sample size, they discovered that 25.4% are more overweight among children in the urban areas, as against 16.2% among children in the rural areas. They have also discovered that overweight and obesity among women in the urban areas is about 21.9% as against 6.7% among women in the rural areas. So clearly, sedentary lifestyles and urban lifestyles are contributing largely towards this health condition which hitherto used to be um, 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 alien and now common among urban people. And Mr. Speaker, this is because increasingly as a nation, we are becoming an urbanized people. And so the effect is that as a nation, we are becoming a sick people. So it is important that we check our lifestyles and I will zero the argument home by saying that I am happy to hear that our gym will soon be up and functional so that when we rise at 4 p.m. or 6 p.m., we will not be in a hurry to drive home, but we will go and exercise before we go home, so that we can come back fit and do business the next day. With these few words, Mr. Speaker, I want to, I want to con congratulate the maker of the statement. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Honorable Nafia Mokwo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the Deputy Minister indicated that this is a national digital property addressing system. Mr. Speaker, I want to find out for him what arrangements they have put in place to ensure that residents in South Dine, in the Volta region, are captured under this project. Thank you very much. Deputy Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm not too sure that I fully understand the question. If you can please come again. Yes, Honorable Member, you may repeat your question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm simply saying that he indicated that this is a national address system. And so I want to find out what arrangements 
they have put in place to ensure that residents in South Dan, in my constituency, because even network to make calls is difficult in South Dan. That's what I'm saying. Excellent. Mr. Speaker, I, I believe that to be able to generate your Mr. Speaker, I believe that to be able to generate your digital address, all you need is a GPS-enabled device, okay? And you, you, you download the app, you are able to download your digital address. If there are challenges with network coverage, there, there's the offline version, which is available um, at the Ghana Post offices. And so if there are specific challenges that he has in his constituency, he can take that with me offline. But I don't expect that there will be a district in Ghana that would not have coverage for any network in Ghana. Um, so we can, we can take it up. Mr. Speaker, it's also very interesting to note that with the National Identification Authority, they have published centers that they are going to use for the registration in every district. And every district that has been published has a digital address. So I think that if there are specific issues, we can take it offline. Thank you very much. Yes, available leader. You see that your time, so you are done. Uh, available leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you. For... Now the road passed through your constituency also. <laughs> that is true, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Indeed, indeed, the second phase starts from my constituency, from Eskuma Junction. Mr. Speaker, I am grateful for the opportunity. I know the section between uh, Adjokwe to Pueve, which is four kilometers, which is four kilometers, it's a very short distance, but it is in an atrocious state. Uh, yes, and so you just gave the assurance that there's a section in the northern region that even though it's not being constructed, you take steps to put it in a motorable state. May I implore you to also consider directing the regional director of highways to also take steps to make that session motorable until the contract is, is the review is done and all other decisions are taken on it uh, as, as soon as possible. In, in, in South Dan, that is Ajokwe to Kweve, four kilometers. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm excited, particularly excited by this uh, question. Mr. Speaker, it's coming from first my colleague MP, and apart from that, he's a twin, I'm a twin, he's Kakra, I'm Penny. So I am excited by his question and the fact that it passes through his constituency. I want to assure you that. I will personally take particular interest in that, and that assurance is hereby given. Thank you. Oh, no. Two from each side. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to side. comment on the statement ably made by the honourable member for. Amanda. Mr. Speaker, it is, it is very important that we acknowledge the, the Muslim religion. It's equally important that we recognize the holy month of Ramadan as very important in our everyday life. Mr. Speaker, even as lawyers, we are taught the principles and laws of Mohammedanism, even though we are in a common law jurisdiction. Mr. Speaker, just so that we understand and appreciate the fundamentals of the Islamic religion and its practices. Mr. Speaker, these are gendered to ensure cohesion in society. It is also to engender brotherliness amongst the people. Mr. Speaker, it is therefore 
worrying that in the statement as ably read, we are told that civil insurrection along religious lines within the West African sub-region is under incidence. I will therefore urge all of us to ensure that we live in peace and harmony irrespective of our religious differences so that, Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, we can do the work of God and country in peace. I thank you for the opportunity. And I wish them, I wish them Holy Ramadan, I wish them Barak Salah, I wish them the best tomorrow and on Friday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable, particularly for going straight to the point. Yes. Yes, Honorable Defem. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member has not given any justification why he's proposing 30 days instead of, instead of three months or 90 days. Mr. Speaker, we, it, it is notorious that public institutions at the end of the financial year take time to gather and prepare the accounts. If we are going to legislate to limit them to 30 days, as we have found out in the, in the public accounts hearing, they will flout it and will not even give reasons for why they are not able to comply within the law in 30 days. So I think that the, the, the three months has given, it's okay. And because, you see, it gives the Auditor General the opportunity to audit the account and submit a copy of it to the board within another three months. So, so the present amendment, with all due respect to my learned brother, uh, is unwarranted. So I am opposed to it, Mr. Speaker. Um, yes, Honorable, I still, I'm still not persuaded. But yes, I'm not a judge here. Yes, I'm um, over for uh, South Dai. South Dai. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, this matter came up at the committee level. And indeed, the, 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 the position was that when we say support, it becomes discretionary. No, oh no. Now, when we speak of compensation, then it is probably anchored in law. It becomes remediable. The person can, can seek judicial remedy in respect of that. So the use of the victim's compensation fund was therefore debated as to whether it should be victims and compensation fund. So, yes. 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 So, so, the, so we debated it, but we thought that we, we couldn't conclude, so we thought that we should bring it to plenary for, for, for the General House to look at whether or not we should, we should use victim, victims and witnesses, or, or we maintain victims' compensation fund. Because the meaning of witness that is an issue here. See, I, if I understand the honourable majority yes. leader clearly, is looking at a situation where somebody who is associated with a witness may be also um, targeted, or in a way. But I'm worried about using victim, which is too wide. If you use a witness, as, as specified in, in the UNCAD, uh, is providing for a witness the causal link between the person we are protecting and somebody who may be at risk as a result. But as soon as you introduce victim, um, I'm afraid that you may be opening the gateway too wide and other people who may not in any way associated with the witness, which is the uh, intentment of the bill to seek to claim compensation under this fund. So I don't know, but uh, 
the decision is for the House to take. Yes, Honorable uh, Saldai, are you moving it on behalf of the minority leader? Mr. Speaker, indeed so, with your permission. Very well, you may proceed. Very well, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, item number VI, clause 22, amendment proposed, paragraph C, line 2, after minister insert in consultation with the minister for finance. And Mr. Speaker, the, the reason is that the use of the minister simplicity that could be confused with the minister in charge of the, of, of the particular ministry, which in this case we are seeking to place it under the Attorney General and Minister for Justice and the Minister of Finance. And so for purposes of clarity and in consonance with how our normal phraseology that we use in framing phrases like this, it thinks that it is opportune that we say that in consultation with the Minister of Finance. I'm just submitted. Yes, honorable. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to comment on the statement ably made by my chairman of the U.S. Ghana Friendship Association in this house. Mr. Speaker, a careful reading of the document that gave birth to the auspicious day we commemorate today, 4th July 1776, to mark the American independence. Paragraph 2 of the document in question is to this effect. It says that we hold this truth to be true and self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mr. Speaker, it is on this foundation that the American nation is built. And so, in all that they do in securing their interests wherever they are, apart from ensuring that there's life and there's liberty, they also ensure that they bring happiness to their people. Mr. Speaker, I'm aware that 219 years later, a country in West Africa Ghana, to be specific, went through the same drudgery and struggle with the same colonial masters, Britain, to attain our independence. And in doing so, our leader at the time, the venerable Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, had to say this. He says, we prefer independence in danger to servitude in tranquility. He said, Speaker, today, we are independent. We have attained self-rule. It has come with a lot of dangers, but we are weathering the storm. And so, like my brother, the Honorable Frank Arnold on prayer said, we'll bid our time. We'll make progress, however slow. But the day will come that we too will be described as the African dream or the Ghanaian dream. Today, Mr. Speaker, Rwanda experienced genocide as recently as 1994. Mr. Speaker, 24 years down the line, the political leadership has turned that country into a role model in terms of leader, political leadership and economic development in Africa. Mr. Speaker, I therefore believe that with the right set of leadership, Ghana can copy or reciprocate the Rwanda model so that we can also make strides. I want to use this opportunity to 
congratulate the American people and wish them happy celebrations. I also want to use the opportunity to say that as part of strengthening our bilateral relationship, three sitting American presidents have visited this chamber and made strong pronouncements on policy issues that, in their own opinion, if, if we stick to those policy matters, it, it will foster our development and make us prosper. I speak specifically of President Clinton, President Bush, and President Barack Obama. We look forward to welcoming Donald Trump if he gets the opportunity to come next year. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, with your, with your very good diplomatic skills, you will ensure that this will be done. Mr. Speaker, I want to, I want to commend my chairman for a well-researched statement on the day. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Honorable. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have several issues with the Clause 17 and amendments being proposed. Mr. Speaker, from, from the debate ensuing, I gather that we are not, the intention of the House is not to deal with legal personnel, qua legal personnel, or properly so called. We are dealing with people, officers from within the Commission who handled some of the pre trial issues or adjudicating on the matters regarding, for instance, preparation of the brief for lawyers to take to court or settling the matters so that it doesn't get to court level at all. So I think the use of legal personnel as a controlling headline, for me, it's, it's a misnomer. It should rather be adjudicating officers so that we can have lawyers, for instance, handling the adjudication. We can have paralegals who are not lawyers properly so-called handling some of the settlements. We can then also have persons, we call them court-connected ADR officers, who are sometimes relied upon by the legal aid, legal aid board, now we are trying to make it become a commission, to use them in their everyday settlement of issues. Because you see, our intention is to make this commission in such a way that they can open office, for instance, in my, in my district capital in Pepe, where you may not have lawyers to work with, but the office must function anyway. So they should be able to have ADR officers properly trained to help them. So that is my understanding of this section. So it should not be legal personnel. Otherwise, tomorrow we'll run into roadblocks in trying to interpret this in a court of law. That's, that's one. Two, I see that the chairman is proposing that we insert a paragraph B and uh, 17 sub 1. But I've, I've already seen an existing paragraph B. So if you recall, yesterday we ran into a similar problem, but the Honorable Yere Chair made the argument that we should leave the outlining and the numbering to the drafting department for them to take care of, to take care of how they have the numbering of the, the, the relevant paragraph that have survived the amendment should be numbered. So I want to plead with him that yes, we may have to carry the amendment, but the B, it shouldn't carry the B. Once it's carried, then they will determine where it will be inserted. Unless, of course, you are saying that by this amendment, the existing B, which is um, 171B, which is National Service Personnel, signed by the National Service but to the Legal Aid Commission will be deleted. If that is not the effect, then it may have to, we may have to give a different numbering to, to the proposition from, from my chairman in the matter. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I believe that our intention is to make use of both, not just lawyers, paralegals, because they will, they will help us a lot to let the commission become effective as well as ADR officers who may not be legally trained persons at all in the course of the normal everyday functions of the office. Thank you very much. 
Um, yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I may be heard. Mr. Speaker, you are charged with an offense, but you are convicted of a crime. So the, it is a trial process that will establish that indeed the offense with which you have been charged is established. If it is proven, then at the point that it is, it is proven, then it becomes a crime. So the penal consequences follow. Yes, that is why the, in the, in the, in the, during the work of the Law Review Commission, some of these thinking in the criminal jurisprudence came up. We had a seminar, my brother, if you recall, uh, VCRC came, espoused on some of these things. So, it, so the, the idea is that when a person, when you are suspected, then it's an offense. So they look for the appropriate charges or a charge to slap you with. When the judicial processes determine that the elements in, in the elements to be proven for you to have been deemed to have committed a crime are established, then you are convicted. Then the sentencing will follow. So it, it's a process. So once you are a suspect, that is why until you are read before a court, you are not called an accused. You are a suspect. But once the police goes through the investigations and, and does the arraignment where you become the Republic versus so and so, then you are now an accused person. It's the same thinking that is brought to bear on the, the, the use of offenses vis a vis the crime. The crime connotes that the elements, the elements in the charges against you for, for you for you having to have been suspected of committing the said offense have been proven judicially. So the consequences will now follow, whether with the Your point is okay. made. Thank you. Are we going to use the offenses or the use crime? Chairman, which one is in line with modern thinking? Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Deputy Minority. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Member, I don't think this is the first time. You've agreed with him before. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll proceed to put the question. Sorry. Honorable Member for... Sabdai. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I believe that one of the cardinal principles of enacting a law is to avoid ambiguities. Mr. Speaker, we, are, we, we stand the danger of enacting a law that will create an ambiguity at the cost of implementation. And it will engender conflict at the district level. Otherwise, there are traditional areas that are already wrangling over which facilities should be cited where. If you leave it dangling or unclarified. Mm. So, Mr. Speaker, on that basis alone, I will support the proposition that we should be specific for the avoidance of doubt. For the avoidance of doubt, we should state that it should be, it should be cited at the district capital so that no feuding traditional area will tomorrow come after and struggle over the district capital as to where this facility should be cited. So I am in support of the, of the, of the proposition that the law as we are crafting it should, should be very clear and state clearly that the, the offices, inciting the offices at the, uh, out of the, out from the center, in, uh, from the metropolitan center in Accra. We should be specific as the regional capital. We should be specific as to the district capital. I believe, I believe on this note, uh, I want to urge the house to move away from leaving the siting of the district capital to, to, to um, anywhere other than the district capital. We should be specific, Mr. Speaker. That's my humble position on the matter. I can only Thank guide you. the House. But I'm aware the headquarters of meat factory was moved from Bulgaria to Accra, and the factory collapsed. You recall that?
I don't want this. Chris. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to look with favor upon this Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. Grant that it may perform its high duty as in thy sight. Give divine guidance to the President of the Republic and thou members of Parliament and ministers of state with discernment and vision, integrity and courage that through the labors of government, this land and people may be well and truly served and thy good purposes for a common human life be realized in our midst. Amen. O God, grant us a vision of our country, fair as it might be, a country of righteousness, where none shall wrong his neighbor, country of plenty, where evil and poverty shall be done away with, country of brotherhood, where all success shall be founded on service, and honor shall be given to a deserving, country of peace, where government shall rest on the will of the people and the love for the common good. Bless the efforts of those who struggle to make this vision a living reality. Inspire and strengthen our people that they may give time, thought, and sacrifice to speed the day for the coming beauty of Ghana and Africa. Amen. We were long in coming because we had to do follow up on certain important matters arising as part of the caucus meeting, and um, that is why we could not uh, come quicker than we did. And there will be a further caucus meeting thereafter in the light of the developments thereafter. So, honorable members, you please kindly heed to the leadership call so that those relevant and pertinent matters will be duly dealt with by this honorable house. Honorable members, item listed two correction of votes and proceedings and official report. Votes and proceedings of Monday, 9 July 2018, page 1. Page 2. Page 3. Page 4. Page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven. Twelve, thirteen. Yes, Honourable. Thank you very much, Right Honourable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to correct the uh, notification that I was absent yesterday. I was here, I was at a committee meeting, and after the committee meeting, I came to the chamber and state of the House rules. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Page 13, page 14, page 15, page 16, page 17, page 18, page 19, page 20. Page 21, page 22, page 
Armaments the votes and proceedings of Monday, 9th July 2018, as corrected, is hereby admitted as true record of proceedings. Honorable members, we have a visiting delegation from the Parliament of the Republic of the Gambia who are now present in the chamber. And I have the pleasure to introduce you to the 14 member delegation of the Finance and Public Accounts Committee of the Gambian Parliament. They are among, here, among others, interact with their counterparts in Ghana exchange best practices. The delegation comprises Honorable Jata, Leader and PAC Vice Chair. Honorable Baru, Majority Leader. Honorable Jame. Honorable Mbo. Honorable Drame. Honorable Kamara, yes. Honorable Jawara, yes. Honorable Jawu, yes. Mr. Far, Consultant, yes. Mr. Jata, Deputy Clerk, Ms. Mbaye, Committee Clerk, Ms. Namusisi, Program Director. Mr. Bojang, Program Assistant. Yes. On your behalf, I welcome them to the House and to the country and for all the fulfillment of the good purposes they are here for. Item list of three questions. Question. Yes, Honorable Deputy Majority Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, the question is directed to the Minister responsible for lands and natural resources. Mr. Speaker, we wish to ask leave of you to allow the Deputy Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Honorable Barbara Otain Jesse, to do the same on behalf of the Minister who is currently. who is currently in the water region with uh, His Excellency on, on the tour. So, Mr. Speaker, he has a genuine excuse not to be in the House. And I urge the minority. <laughs> to cooperate for the minister, who again is one of our own, to answer the question. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. And a lady, for that matter. So I know minority leader wants to hear a feminine voice this morning. So you should allow her to answer the question. Thank you. Honorable Minority Leader. Mr. Speaker, we are reasonable men and women here. And we are aware that the president is in the Volta region. The minister is one of his lieutenants from that region serving the republic. Therefore, ordinarily, there would be no objection, except to say that I saw the deputy leader dancing for advice, whether to say the minister had traveled abroad or was within the country, because she knew, <laughs> because she knew that if she raised that, we would have reminded her that there is a ban on travel. So since this travel, 
since this travel is local, we will welcome the Deputy Minister to stand in the seat of them. Honorable Deputy Minister, you may take the relevant seat. Honorable Nafia Miko, Honorable Member for South Dai. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources whether any concessionaire has been granted permit to harvest timber from the Volta Lake. Thank you. Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as per our records, the only company granted approval to harvest, process, transport, and market timber submerged under the Volta Lake is the Clark Sustainable Resources Development Limited, CSRD. The agreement to harvest, process, transport, and market the timber submerged under the Volta Lake was signed between the Government of Ghana and CSRD, a Canadian company, on April 27, 2010, and subsequently ratified by Parliament on November 30, 2010. Mr. Speaker, apart from CSRD, there is no record of any other company granted approval to harvest timber in the Volta Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Honorable. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Um, may, may I find out from the Honorable Minister whether or not she's aware that there's another company that are engaged in the under lake water uh, uh, log harvesting along certain communities in my constituency? From Golovime, Ajokwe, Oda, Agodake, Germany to Ajebi, whether whether that the activities of that company has come to the attention of of her ministry. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker. The ministry is not aware, but we'll take a cue from what um, the honorable member has said and we shall investigate. Thank you. Honorable. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, indeed, the name of this company is called Didesu Company Limited, and they are in operation. No, no, this is very important, and they are in operation. May, would, would her ministry give us a timeline as to would, would, would her minister give us timelines if they would do a fact-finding mission to the area in question and ascertain what I speak of. Thank you very much. Order. Mr. Speaker, we shall resort to the usual processes of investigating and report to the House in due course. Thank you. Honorable Dafiami Po has indicated his satisfaction. In the circumstances, Honorable Minister, thank you for attending to the House and answering our questions. You are respectfully discharged. Very well. Yes, Honorable Dafiami uh, Po. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I am in support 
of the second amendment or the further amendment proposed by the Honorable Koshiga to the matter before us. Mr. Speaker, because you see, the, the law provides that within one year upon coming into effect, public institutions will make information available. And regarding their organizational structure, their core business, and all, and all that they do. But really, that is not what our people are interested in. They are interested in who are the beneficiaries of their business transactions, and all that. Chairman, that, that so, will be available. Yes. Will be. For now, we are providing for general information. So let's deal with the general provisions. And we can take them as specifics. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. That is why I am in support of uh, the Honorable Koshiga's proposal that we should take out the general. Because his rendition took out the general. Yes, we have agreed to that. Yes. And so I am in support of that amendment. I, I made further proposals. Instead of using government, because government has been used in clause two. Yes. We just follow it up and say, for the purposes of clause one, information shall be, and that is in reference to the clause two one. Uh, then, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I support your position because it will actually be in consonance with the definition as, uh, as enunciated by my brother in Article 295 as to the, the meaning ascribed to government in the Constitution. Yes, Honorable. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to uh, support the statement ably made by my Deputy Chairman of the Ghana Turkey Friendship Association. Mr. Speaker, from the days when Emperor Constantinople or Emperor Constantine from the city of Constantinople to establish Christianity in the Northern Territory in the Roman Empire, to when the Ottoman Turks invaded the city and established the religion of Mohammedanism, which has dominated Turkey in modern day times. Turkey has risen to become... Remember, what religion did you say there was? Mohammedanism. Wow. Yes. In, really In other words, Islam. Islam. Uh, <laughs> I recall that there was a debate in the house and the law actually is uh, Mohammedan's law. And uh, Muslims objected very strongly that they are not Mohammedans. That's why I was... Yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know in law school we are taught that the laws are called in the laws of Mohammedanism. So, Mr. Speaker, I take a cue. But the most important thing is that Turkey as a nation has risen to become such important social, cultural, and political force in, in Central Europe. Mr. Speaker, leaving the generals, moving from the generals to the specific, Turkey has over the years established very strong ties with Ghana in terms of awarding scholarships to a lot of Ghanaians to study in the areas of engineering and um, medicine. Mr. Speaker, they have also increasingly improved the number of scholarships they award to Ghanaians to study Arabic. They have also helped in the areas of commerce and indeed in tourism. We have seen that over the years they've established the Turkish airline now flies to Ghana. Mr. Speaker, it's very important that we, we as a country can learn from the rapid progress that Turkey is making as a nation. We, we are described as a middle, as a lower middle income earning country. And so 
the, the commercial activities that we have to undertake to ensure that we move from the lower ranks to the upper ranks as a middle income any country will have to do. Mr. Speaker, you will see that the, the, the figures show that there's a lot of um, um, uh, trade improvements between Ghana and Turkey. A lot of Ghanaians now fly to Istanbul to do business or to bring goods from Istanbul to Ghana to say, not China alone. Turkey has become one of our most important trade partners. And so, Mr. Speaker, on, 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 on the occasion that they have successfully elected their president and they are looking forward to make progress, we can only wish them well and, and say that we are looking forward for the opportunity for members of the Ghana Turkey Friendship to visit the, 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 the National Assembly in, in, in Turkey to, to, as it were, uh, improve on how we do business in the House. With these few words, Mr. Speaker, I congratulate the maker of, of the statement. Thank you very much. Yes, honourable members, it's now clear and yes, yeah, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, I am struggling to understand my chairman on this matter. Mr. Speaker, you see, at the office of the president, in fact, every single information is treated as confidential. And the president be an executive president can decide that every single information must be for my consumption. He will then minit it to whichever officer is, 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 is appointed to, to handle that particular matter. So if we are saying that the, the, the true intention of this house is to exempt information meant for the consumption of the president, Practically, we are saying that we cannot assess any information from the office of the presidency. So it is only... No, 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 Chairman, Chairman, please. Let me finish. You see, we have, we have enacted laws in this, in this house with a very clear intention, but the implementers outside are, are putting a different interpretation and they have become a matter for litigation. So we, so we cannot simply say that it is only information meant for the consumption of the president or the vice president that should be exempted. We must, we must be very clear in our mind which information meant for the president we are seeking to exempt. Otherwise, the implementers will tell us that, for instance, if somebody wants to know the full list of of staff or staffers at the office of the presidency, they will tell you this information or this file particularly is meant for the consumption of the president confidentially, so it is exempted. We'll be running into litigation. So we must avert our minds. We just enacted NIA amendment law. The sub the, the omnibus clause that we 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 put in the law to take care of other sources of information has become a subject of litigation. I am not wrong. So I am saying we must take you from some of these things and be very clear as to which information exactly are we seeking or do we speak of in this matter. Thank you very much. Honorable Member for Daboya. Most grateful. Yes. Any point of order? Indeed, so, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Yes. Speaker, on grounds of uh, clarification, I, I'm seeking clarification in the matter. Mr. Speaker, per the amendment we just carried, does the all survive? Would it survive? There's an all in the 51A, the one we just carried. We. We deleted office of the president or and inserted the president or the vice president for consideration. Exactly. If you look at the amendment at item six, Roman six. 
Yes, Mr. Speaker. So that's what we have. Yes. Uh, yes, Speaker, if you, I mean, what contains, contains matters, the disclosure of which will reveal information concerning opinion, advice, deliberation, recommendations, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, the motion is that clause 5, sub clause 1, paragraph B, delete the words F8. It's for the consideration of the House. Yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I support the present uh, amendment proposed by the Chairman, except to seek clarification that in 51A, we, we redrafted up to up to where we have sub submitted to the president or the vice president for consideration. But in that sentence, there's an all. Because that is one range of information that can be exempted. Now we are moving to a second range of information that can also be exempted. So my, 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 my position is that the all as contained in 51A has we, to survive. We, we deleted it. Yes, but Mr. Speaker, in these circumstances, it has to survive. No, no, no. After the Vice President for consideration, then there will be a comma. Or where the information contains matters. No, we deleted the all. Yes, the honourable member is right. Yes. The all but must yes. stay. Who decides? Who makes it? Humbly submitted, Mr. Speaker. After honourable members, the motion has been moved. It's for the consideration of the House. Yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Mr. Speaker, I've been trying to catch your eye for some time until my chairman moved this motion. Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I seek your guidance in this matter. There's no advertised amendment to 51B Roman numeral 2. But I, I, I wish to seek your leave to propose an amendment to the word prejudice. Yes. That you remember, you said what, 51... 51, no, 51BII. Sub clause 51 BII. Yes. Uh, I seek your leave to propose an amendment that the word prejudice be deleted and the word damage to damage or damage national security. Mr. Speaker, this is because we we are we are legislation we are legislating regarding a constitutional right to access to information. And the, when we use the word prejudice, the standard to me that is of a lower threshold than when you use the word damage. And my fear is that if we leave the word prejudice, national security, any information officer who, whose responsibility is to generate information of this nature can simply say this information prejudices national security. So on, on that ground, I will, I will not accede to your request. But when the information is likely to cause damage to national security, it is of a higher threshold. And I believe that because this is a constitutional right, we must have recourse to the higher threshold. That unless the information Unless the information can cause damage to national security, it ought not to be exempted. It, that, that is why I am seeking your leave that because it, it, the amendment I'm proposing is not advertised. Honorable member, I refuse the leave. Because Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, 
with all due respect, with all due respect to the Honorable Animal, the principle that he's using is wrong because it is not simply about ownership of vehicles. You see, you are saying that it is akin to property, property rate. Property rate does not distinguish between how luxurious the property is or not. Once it is... Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on, listen to me, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. The property rate, you pay according to the nature and the purpose. This one, you are saying that, you are saying that a vehicle of a certain capacity makes you rich. Makes you rich. Or makes you, the fact that you own a vehicle of that manner, that makes you are a wealthy you. person. And I'm saying it is a very wrongful assumption to make. When you own a property, whether it is a wattle or dab or a property in East Legon, you are rated according to the nature of the property. But this one, you are cutting down the number of people who own vehicles below the capacity of 3cc. And you are saying that anybody who owns vehicle 3cc or above and the vehicles are private, they are supposed to pay the tax. And those who also own the vehicles but use it for commercial purposes and take passengers beyond 10 people, they are also supposed to, not supposed to pay. To but there are a lot of vehicles that take passengers below, below 10 people. And they are commercial vehicles and they are in serious business. So the assumptions are so wrongful. So the analogy that this is akin to property rate payment is with all due respect. On top of Honourable members, I'll put a question. All in favor of the proposed amendment say aye.